HBC Toolkit has been funded for the last uh, several years with some funding from the DOE XTAC program. We also received some funds from Argonne and, and Livermore, as well as some funds from Intel. So the work that I'm going to talk about is, has been done over a, a long number of years. Currently, there are two project uh, staff working on this, uh, as well as myself, and we have a collection of uh, students who are alumni who have moved on. So the challenge for you as computational scientists are that the platforms are evolving very rapidly. The architecture has uh, lots of different flavors of multi-core designs. There's increasing diversity. Some, some things have multi-core architectures. There's the forthcoming um, Knight's Landing, a many-core architecture the forthcoming Coral systems, and also Titan used GPU accelerators. And so the thing that you're aware of as an application developer is, is exploding parallelism within the node. And so for applications, what this means is that you need to exploit threaded parallelism as well as MPI in order to get the most out of these systems, that uh, if you're not using vectors, then you're also not getting the most out of the systems. And then finally, you're going to be working on your applications to add new physics modules or things like that for your simulations. And so you need some guidance in order to, uh, to execute this well. And so what you need really are some guidance to adapt to changes in the emerging architectures, to improve your scalability of your codes both within and across nodes, and also to assess weaknesses in your algorithms or particular uh, issues associated with the implementation. It might not be the algorithm, but just some issues in the implementation that can cause some significant performance losses. And so our contention is that performance tools can really play um, an important role as a guide. And so I'm not talking about getting the last couple percent of performance. It's like discovering there, there's gaping wounds in your application performance, and you might be missing things by um, a large integer factor or your scalability is off, which will prevent you from using any of these large-scale machines effectively. And so those are the kinds of things that are most interesting to look at with performance tools. So the challenges are that the node architectures are complex. So there's multi-level parallelism, multiple cores, instruction level parallelism, um, SIMD instructions for short vectors, and also uh, on some of the machines, accelerators. All of the machines have a, a deep memory hierarchy, and the memory runs a lot slower than the processor uh, clock rate. And so um, often what you'll find is that a program will only get maybe 15% of peak or so, um, and that it requires some significant improvements in order to, to get significantly higher than that. So if uh, you're not paying attention to performance at all, you'd be lucky if you get 15% of peak, I think. Um, the gap typically is, is, is huge, and so using a tool, you can find out what some of the problems are and, and then address them. So with uh, the kinds of systems like Mira or uh, any of really the, the high-end supercomputers and clusters these days, um, on massively parallel applications, it's a challenge to just measure the, the application performance and also to analyze the data that comes out of it. And then finally, what we want to be able to do is to find this needle in a haystack, turn all of this performance data into insight. And so um, it's particularly hard on supercomputers because you're interested not only in just like the node performance, you're also interested in data movement and communication and I.O. as well. So I would argue that what you as users want are some multi-platform programming model independent tools, something that you can use with, uh, with MPI programs, something that you can use with partition global address space languages. I saw from the mailing list that there was some work with Charm and with uh, Chapel earlier um, in the, uh, the, the session. And so you can use our tools with really any of those programming models. It doesn't require MPI. So, our tools are designed to work with large multilingual codes, so a mixture of C, C++, sometimes Fortran, um, heterogeneous parallelism within and across nodes. By heterogeneous here, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, OpenMP plus, um, plus MPI, but we also have some support for GPUs as well that's, uh, that's going to be getting better over the next couple of years as we prepare for Coral. So, um, you want to be analyzing the performance of optimized code. So loop optimization, templates, inlining, and the tool has to be aware of these things and then show you what the differences are. And even in the presence of, of 
uh, lots of, of C++ templates. Uh, we don't insert instrumentation everywhere and sort of degrade your performance because um, it would be it would be disastrous if every time, say, the template expanded, that we were putting in instrumentation at the beginning and the end of of the functions and the templates because many of the the templates end up um, just all getting inlined and turning into uh, very small amounts of code. So we work with binary only libraries. Sometimes they're partially stripped, like the OpenMP runtime systems. And then complex execution environments, we work with uh, both statically linked and dynamically linked on the microkernel OSs like on uh, the BlueGene systems as well as on Linux clusters. So the goal of the, the tools were to provide insightful analysis that pinpoints and explains problems that you have and then correlate measurements with your source codes so that you can figure out what you need to do rather than just um, providing you with say, pretty pictures that show you that, uh, that there's, a, there's obviously a problem with your application, but you can't really figure out where. That's not, that's not the goal of our tool. We want to sort of pinpoint with individual source lines and say, this is the place to fix. And then they should scale. So let me first tell you about uh, Rice's HPC Toolkit, and then I'll talk about using it to pinpoint scalability bottlenecks, how to understand how an application evolves over time, assessing the variability of processes, understanding the performance of threading, and then what's uh, some of the ongoing work. And now at the end of the slides, there's some, some slides that I'm not going to talk about that have the details of, of using this on Mira or on uh, clusters. HPC Toolkit employs uh, binary level measurement and analysis. So it allows you to observe fully optimized, dynamically linked executions. Um, also, you can do statically linked executions as well on uh, the Cray systems and on the, the BlueGene systems. Supports multilingual code with external binary only libraries, so you may not have source code for your math library or for uh, the OpenMP runtime, but that's okay. We use uh, sampling based performance measurements, so we periodically interrupt the application as it's running and say, Where are you now? Okay, so we can do this uh, over time and say, like, a thousand times a second, tell it every thread to report sort of where, it, where is it now. And then over time, we can get a picture of where, where you've been and what, what you spend your time doing. You can also use hardware performance counters to say, interrupt me every, every uh, millionth cache miss or something. And so by seeing where the interrupts occur, then you can see where all the cache misses are, are bothering your application. So you can use hardware performance counters or timers in order to do the sampling. You can control the overhead of sampling by selecting an appropriate sampling frequency. So if you think that, uh, the, like on, on Mira, the nodes are running at, a, like I think it's 1.6 gigahertz is the, the clock rate. And so um, you don't want to take an interrupt every time you get a cache miss, okay? Because you're getting cache misses like every couple of cycles. So if you take an interrupt every million cache misses or something like that, then maybe that's going to yield a sampling rate of around 1,000. Uh, per second. So that's the kind of thing that you want. But um, you can, if you find that the overhead is too high, then you can just turn up the, the uh, sampling period and, and then reduce your overhead. So what we want to do with sampling is minimize uh, systematic error and avoid blind spots. So we're collecting data through your program, through libc, through the math libraries, through the OpenMP runtime systems. And the strategy that we've been working on is, is to collect data for large-scale parallelism. So the, the tool collects and correlates multiple derived performance metrics. It uh, associates the metrics with both uh, static and dynamic context. And by static context, what I mean is procedures and loop nests and inline code. In dynamic context, I mean calling context. So the tool supports top-down performance analysis so you can identify what, what's most important to you and then drill down and see where the, the costs are incurred in the call chains and the code. So how does the whole thing work? Well, what we have is a, a toolkit that has several tools in it, but there really aren't that many, and it's really fairly easy to use. So you start by compiling and linking your application the way you normally do. If you're using a, a cluster that has um, dynamically linked binaries, then you don't have to do anything at compile time. But for um, statically linked executables for BlueGene Q, then you need to do one thing, which is in the final link step, you need to use our linker wrapping script, HPC link. And what this will do 
is it will add a little bit of code into your application for measuring its performance, and it will also wrap a couple of uh, calls that uh, are made by the, the runtime system inside your application. So we want to catch process and thread creation, finalization, signals, things like that. So then once you've, once you've uh, prepared your application for profiling, so in the case of a dynamically linked code, then you'll just launch your application with our launcher script, HPC Run, and that will turn on the profiling. It will inject our profiler code into your code's address space. HPC Link does that for statically linked executables at compile time. And then you can specify a couple of arguments saying what you want to collect. So I can specify that there are hardware performance counters that I want to measure. I can specify that I want every thread to be interrupted periodically over time. Um, and then using this, I collect statistical call path profiles of the events that I've specified. And so what I mean by a call path profile is that when one of these interrupts goes off. So let's say I said interrupt the execution a thousand times a second. When an interrupt goes off, I find that I'm at a particular instruction. And then what we do is we unwind the call stack, finding a chain of return addresses all the way up to main. So I find that I'm in C, called by B, called by A, called by main. Okay? And so I, I get this chain. And then over time, as the application executes, we take each of these chains and we fold them together in something called a calling context tree. So conceptually, you can think that um, the root up there represents main. And then um, on the, the left, maybe there's some sort of initialization phase. Another subtree might represent uh, your core solve phase. Another phase might represent um, post-processing. So the overhead of collecting these call path profiles is proportional to your sampling frequency, not to the frequency with which you're making calls in the application. And so we can control the overhead by just specifying an appropriate period, saying 1,000 times a second or 200 times a second if, if the 1,000 is causing too much overhead. OK. So we used HPC run, and we'll collect these call path profiles. A second step is to do binary analysis. So we, we have a, a tool called HPC struct. And what you do is it analyzes your binary to recover program structures. So it'll parse the machine code for your executable, look at whatever line map and debugging information that the compiler has left inside the binary. It will um, figure out where the loop nests are, but from the machine code, it builds a control flow graph, it analyzes the control flow graph looking for cycles, identifies the loops, figure out which instructions are in loops, figure out what inline code is present throughout your application, and then it takes the optimized loops for your program and kind of folds them back together to figure out how to present it as uh, you would understand it. So you're probably less interested in the fact that you had one loop nest that got torn into several pieces by the compiler for sort of a pre-loop, a steady state, and a post-loop. What you want to know is, what is my loop cost? And so with the binary analyzer, we see the way the binary is written, and then we figure out how we're going to present it to put it back together in a way that you would understand. OK, so the HPC struct, this doesn't have to be done after the execution, it can be done as part of your make file, it can also be done while your, your code is executing. Then the, the third step is we're taking the call path profiles, which we gathered from the execution. We take the program structure information, which says where's the inline code, the loop nests, the procedures, and we combine these things together. And then what that leaves us with is um, a, uh, a a database of, of information that we can look at with these graphical user interfaces. So the process of putting these together, there's two utilities, HPC Prof, which is a sequential program, which you can run on, say, the head node of a cluster. Um, and then there's HPC Prof MPI. So if you're collecting data on thousands of things, then probably analyzing all of these profiles um, individually is costly. So you can use HPC Prof MPI and launch it on the cluster and use 64 or 128 nodes to analyze uh, profiles from, from thousands of things. And then um, finally, we have these two graphical user interfaces. So they allow you to explore the performance data from multiple perspectives. You can rank order based on uh, using metrics that either were measured directly, or you can construct derived metrics um, that represent things like um, 
wasted effort or um, latency, and then figure out, uh, so from those metrics or scalability loss, you can, you can ask where those metrics are prominent in, in your code, and um, then you can graph the metrics for individual threads for individual calling contexts, and you can also explore the evolution of behavior over time using uh, this tracing facility that we have. So this is a, a snapshot of our HPC viewer tool. And so what we've done here is we've collected these call path profiles um, for every individual MPI rank in the application, and then we've folded them all together. And so what we have here are three panes. There's a source pane, then there's a navigation pane, which shows like call paths through this, and then there's a metric pane, which shows um, the metrics that have been measured. And so in this case, what we have is a, a wall clock metric. So this is just looking at where the application spent its time. So in the, the viewer, there's some view controls, so I can look down this calling context tree so I can see that main called several things and then each of those things there's maybe a, an initialization phase, a solve phase, and a post-process phase. So I can go look down the call chains in any of the individual phases. Then there's a bottom-up view, the caller's view, where you might have something like um, matrix multiply might be called or MPI weight might be called from many places inside your application. And what this does is it takes all of the costs and it bundles them together and then it allows you to see along which contexts um, these costs were incurred. So if I know how much cost was, was uh, attributed to MPI weight in the program, then I can look and find out, okay, so if I'm doing some sort of climate model, is the weighting in the atmosphere simulation or the ocean simulation or the land simulation, that sort of thing. Then there's a flat view which just says, I don't care where you were called from, just show me um, where the costs are incurred in the code, and that will show you uh, procedures, inline code, loop nests, and all that. Then there's um, a couple of things for controlling the metric display. There's this flame button, which is really useful. It's for showing hot paths, so you can just sort of point at main and then hit the flame button, and then it will unravel all of this looking deep down into your call stack. So the, the way that it works is it says, well, if I have a node like a, a caller, and then it makes a couple of calls itself, if any one of them accounts for 50% or more of the cost, well, why don't I go look in there? And then it, will allow, then it will continue opening the chain until I get to a point where there's where the, the costs kind of shatter. So I have some node that has a bunch of children that where none of them accounts for 50% or more. And so you can use this flame button not only from the top, but I can point at anything in there and just use the flame button to open up some subtree or open up the important paths in some subtree. And you'll see how that works in just a minute. Then there's uh, this f of x um, utility for computing derived metrics. So I'll show you how that works. And then there's also a column selector. So you may have collected lots of different metrics, but you only want to look at a few. You can also take the, the columns and reorder them by just dragging them back and forth. So in this display, you'll find that there's not only call chains. So um, in this, it shows that main calls AMR Godinov, and then it shows loops at various places, but then it also shows inline code. And so the cost of having this information about loops and inline code, it costs us nothing when we measure it. This is from overlaying the binary analysis on top of the measurement data. And so that's what you get from this HPC struct tool. So what it'll, it'll show you is if you've got some heavily templated program in C++, it will show you all of the inline code that comes out of it and how these things are composed together. So when you're working with machines like Mira, the problem is that uh, that you're trying to scale. And so it's often the case that as you scale out to larger numbers of nodes, your uh, efficiency drops off. So ideally what you'd like is an efficiency of one, but um, often it ends up being a lot less than that. And so the question then is, what's the, the cause of the performance losses? So what we have is our tool can support an automatic scaling analysis. So you can pinpoint scalability bottlenecks. It'll guide you to the problems, quantify the magnitude of each problem. The only thing that's left up to you is to diagnose the nature of the problem. So it'll point you exactly where the problem is, but figuring out what it is and why is often something that's a little bit more art than uh, something that we can do automatically. So the challenges for pinpointing scalability bottlenecks are that 
applications use lots of layers of libraries, and so the performance is often context dependent. So here I've shown sort of a simple skeleton that you might find inside a climate application where the main program calls land and sea ice and ocean and atmosphere modules, and then inside each of those there's an MPI weight. And so the, co the cost that's associated with MPI weight or where weighting occurs is probably very dependent upon the modules that are calling it. And so I need to understand the performance in context. I need to know that it's not just that weighting is happening in my program, it's that weighting is happening in the ocean module which is very load imbalanced, for instance. So in terms of monitoring, what we're looking for are bottlenecks of any kind. So that might be computation, it might be data movement, it might be synchronization, our tool doesn't know. So the concerns we have are we want to try and collect a, an acceptable amount of data and we don't want to perturb your execution very much. Otherwise, we'll be measuring problems that aren't really part of it. So the way that you do this is when you scale your application, you run it at sort of a couple of different scales. Two is fine. So either you're taking the same problem and running it on a larger number of processors, that would be strong scaling, or weak scaling, as you double the number of processors, you're doubling the problem size so that the problem size is going to be constant for each of the individual processors. So then you put your expectations to work. You measure your performance under different conditions um, at, at different scales. You express your expectations as an equation that I expected the time to be constant so I can look at differences as, as scalability losses. And I can compute the deviation from the expectations and then correlate the metrics with the source code. So conceptually what's going on is we're measuring a calling context tree. So let's say uh, we measured a calling context tree for P processors, so say 256. And then I went and I measured it at 8K processors. And so if I found that for, um, for strong scaling, if I spent 400K units of the time in the solver with a small number of processors and then 600K units of time for uh, a larger number of processors, what that means is since I'm trying to solve the same problem, then that's wasted effort. I have, a, I have 200K units of time as wasted effort in, in the solver, and that represents scalability loss. So if I'm doing weak scaling, then I can just take this same idea and apply some coefficients and, uh, and calculate my losses as well. So let me show you how this works. So um, I'm going to show this for a parallel AMR application. It's a code called Flash, which was developed at the University of Chicago. It does block structured AMR. Um, it does compressible reactive flows and solves a broad range of astrophysical problems. So the demo I have is some performance data that we collected for a white dwarf detonation on a blue gene P system on 256 uh, MPI ranks versus 8K MPI ranks, and it was doing weak scaling. So it's a little hard to hold the mic here, so I'm just going to talk close to the laptop. So let me go pull up HPC Viewer. So HPC Viewer is one of the graphical user interfaces, and what I'm going to load in is data from a 256 process execution and an 8K process execution. And I've got several columns here. I've got inclusive costs for the 256K, the 256 processor execution, exclusive costs for that, and then for the 8K execution. So what I mean by inclusive costs are costs that are incurred by a caller and everything that it calls, or exclusive costs are costs that are just incurred by a function. So if I press the flame button, so I can pick a column and press the flame button, and then it says, okay, so um, the time that was spent in flash, 88% of the time is spent in uh, driver evolve flash, 11% in driver init flash, and driver finalized flash. So I can point at something and then press the flame button and it can show me now the costs underneath this shatter, and so the highest uh, thing doesn't account for half. So this allows me to kind of walk through the calling context tree, and I can see that there's a function. I can point at a function. I can point at this little icon here, which is a call site, to see where the function is called. And so I can see that the hydro function, there's the code for hydro, is called on lines 188, it's called on 145, and so I can separate out the cost that's incurred for each of these calls. All right. So uh, 
So let's look at the scalability losses. So go back to the calling context view, and I'm going to compute the difference between those two trees. So I'm going to say, let's look at the inclusive time on AK processors, and I'm going to subtract off uh, the time on 256 processors. So it's just like a spreadsheet. I'm just going to write a little equation here. Um, I'm going to multiply it by, so that, that's a, a difference, and then I can divide through by the total time on AK processors, so I end up with a fraction, multiply it by 100, so I get a percent, and then this is scalability loss. Percent scalability loss, and then display it as a percent. And that gave me a new column out here. And it says I have a 24% scaling loss. What that means is that when I went from 256 nodes out to 8K nodes, I'm running at 76% parallel efficiency, relative parallel efficiency, OK? So that means I'm not getting, I'm losing 25% of the benefit of the, the processors. Now, where is the scaling loss occurring? We can see that of, of the 24% loss, that 14% is in driver evolve flash. 10% is in driver init flash. So let's go and find out where the losses are in here. So I just click and it opens all the way up in the, the call tree. And then it takes me to a spot. And I can see it just points to something that's near the start of a loop. And I can see this says loop overall processors. So as I add more processors going from 256 to 8K, then a loop that goes over all processors is going to be doing more iterations. So what actually is going on is this is inside this uh, AMR, Adaptive Mesh Refinement, Refine, Derefine. And so as the, the, uh, the setup happens, the application is, is doing refinements. And then what it has to do is it says, well, I've got a block, and I need to know who the neighbors are. And I have no idea who's got the neighboring blocks. So what it does is it packs up the information about the blocks it has, and it sends it to its right neighbor. And everybody's doing this, and the, and the messages flow around a ring. And then by the time all the messages have gone around a ring, I know what everybody has, and I know who has my neighbors. So it's a, a way of doing an all-to-all -all so that you don't have to receive the data from everybody at once. However, it's got this linear time component. And so with like a couple of clicks, and I find right where we are. And so if we look inside, there's all of these send receives. So that's the part that's art right, is understanding what's going on with the code, like that it's got all these send receives, what's the algorithm here, and then how am I going to fix it, OK? So it doesn't work just for this one thing. So if I, if I go into driver init flash, um, that was looking in grid init domain. There's also a 2% loss in grid init, and I can go look inside that. And so it turns out I'm uh, at the end of a loop, and there's a call to MPI barrier. And if I look up at the code a little bit, there's a bunch of reads. And then I find another do IPROC equals 0 to NP is minus 1. So this is saying um, every processor is, if it's your turn, open the input file and read the input, instead of just reading it once and then broadcasting it. OK? So um, any rate. So the scalability bottlenecks, it's pretty easy to find these things by just by using this interface. Now, I mentioned that most of the, the scaling loss was inside driver evolve flash. So if I click on this and, and look inside it a little bit, well, the costs shatter. And so I'll just pick the top thing and say there's a grid update refinement. And then I dig in, and I find that actually I'm back at the same problem that was occurring in the initialization phase. OK? So a couple of minutes here, I just looked at. 8, 256 to 8,000 cores and identified scaling bottlenecks. And all I really had to do was type a spreadsheet equation. OK, let's switch back to the slides. So the other thing that you can do, um, so I showed you this example. And so when using this insight, then um, Anshu Dube, who spoke to you, I guess, a day or so ago, um, replaced the the all to all um, sending the data around a ring with a custom construction. And then um, instead of having time that increased as we went to the number, uh, larger number of processors, in fact, the time was flat. And so they got much better scaling. This was just for the, uh, the construction phase here. So the, the data that I show you so far in this, this uh, code-oriented viewer, we've collapsed out the temporal dimension. 
Okay? We've also collapsed out across all the MPI ranks. So what we're looking at is the sum of all of these things. And so some of the things in, in profile view, you can't really tell why things occurred. You might find that you've got some heavy costs here, but you don't understand why they occurred. So one thing that can be useful is to look at how the execution evolves over time. So I mentioned that we're using sampling. But one thing that we can do is we can, we can collect a series of samples and keep them separate instead of just bundling them into a profile. And so at um, each time t, you're collecting a sample and unwinding its call chain. And so what you see there is like a line of samples, and that corresponds to a thread. So over time, we can sample a thread and, and look at what its call chains are at every t, t plus delta, t plus 2 delta. And then we can do that for every other MPI rank and every other thread in the application. And then what this is giving us is we now have a call path for every, in, for every time where we sampled. And then we can look at this at different levels. So there's a, a plane that's shown here. So think of this as a visibility plane. If we pull it all the way up to the top, we can see that everybody is in main or things main called. And so that would then show blue. Or we can move it down and look at the program at like a slightly lower level of abstraction and see that, well, main called init and then solve and then post process. And then we move down a little further and then we start to see the details inside the phases. So, what we're doing here is we're sampling when we're doing the measurement, but then we're also um, sampling as we show you these things in the viewer as well, because if I've collected samples over a run for 20 minutes or five hours, I don't have enough pixels on my display to show you everything. So let me show you what the HPC Trace Viewer interface looks like. So this is based on the same sort of sampling data. So this actually is data from our own tools analyzing data from a collection of profiles. So up top, what we have here is the cursor is in the middle. And this is the crosshair here is on rank 32. So this was just a 64 rank execution. And so um, I have timelines that flow from left to right. And then the processes or threads flow from from top to bottom, so they're, they're lined up. And so here it shows green. It doesn't seem very informative. What it says is like everybody was in main or things main called for the entire execution. Okay, And what, what's shown over here is a call stack. So this shows me a complete call stack at the place where the cursor is shown. So that is on th thread 32 at 405 seconds into the execution. Okay, This is something that was run on Mira. So then I can move down a level. Still looks all the same. Main calls real main. And then underneath it, now I can see that the application is sort of broken into several different phases. So the first phase here is, um, is call path read. And then the second phase is reduce. And then the third phase is broadcast. And then read structure, make summary metrics, make thread metrics, copy trace files, and then finalize. And then this is then process one is writing some output. So while, while, while MPI rank one is writing out an XML file, everybody else is just waiting. Okay? If I look down at a little lower level of detail, now you start to see some patterns. So does anybody have any idea what this pattern might represent? Hmm? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reduction. Okay? So what happens is we've we, we have uh, trees, we have these call and context trees for lots of, of different processes. And so what happens is that every individual MPI rank is scooping up some of them and they, and they combine them together. And then we do this reduction so that they all end up going up to rank zero and then the result gets broadcast out to everybody and then we move into the next phase of the application. And if I look down a little more, we see, in fact, there's another reduction that happens later in the execution. So really, you get to see the way the application evolves. And so then if I point in, in here while this reduction is happening, in fact, the other threads are waiting in a barrier um, until, uh, until the reduction completes. Okay. So, um, so you can see this, this sort of um, evolution of the behavior over time, and it can provide some insight into why there's imbalance or how the imbalance is arising. I have some other examples in some slides that I'll show you later. So um, you can also use this summary view, which will then basically just sort of like add the pixels and show you what fraction um, 
what fraction of the display is in the different colors. And so then by selecting a pixel of a certain color, I can find out what the color means. So this dark green is compute metrics. And so that then um, there's, well, yeah. sadly, it's not showing, well, the mouse over is not showing me, uh, is not showing me the percents in there. So problem is this is done using Eclipse, and so it's like Java. So it's like write once and debug everywhere. So it, you'll find that the Linux version works a little differently than the Mac version. So, um, all right. So that's um, looking at behavior over time. So one of the things that we've been doing is working on support for OpenMP. And the problem is that, um, that OpenMP worker threads are different than the, the main processes. And so if you look at an implementation level view, it's kind of hard to get a picture of what's going on. And so what we've done is we've designed this uh, new tools interface for OpenMP that we're trying to get adopted as part of the MPI, uh, sort of as uh, part of the OpenMP standard. And so the goal was to have something that could be always on. And, uh, and what it does is it provides some hooks for tools to use. And so what this does is it shows how um, we're able to take uh, an MPI program that has a bunch of OpenMP threads and kind of knit the whole thing together and show this one um, user level profile where you can see as if the, the OpenMP functions are being called from in their natural calling context. We can graph across here and show the uh, views for the individual threads who's computing in here and who's not. Some of the threads are not computing and other threads are. And then we can get the, back to the source code view as well. So this is looking at um, this uh, trace viewer using this uh, OpenMP support. And so what we can see here, there's the big gray regions. This gray uh, corresponds to OpenMP worker threads that are idle. And then, so you can see that there are a set of MPI ranks. And occasionally, they'll do some OpenMP work and then Lots of, lots of time during the setup phase, they're not. And then the solve phase, there's a lot more intense OpenMP activity. So um, the OMPT support um, gives you some better understanding of what's going on with OpenMP. So just to show that this can't be used just for small things, this is for um, 2,400 ranks on a Xeon fee. And so this is the same application. And, and here we see some staggering, and that's because the clocks aren't synchronized across the nodes, and we don't actually make any attempt to synchronize. We don't add extra synchronization to your program, and we don't try and post-process in the synchronization yet in the tools. And so uh, you can see that there's just like a sea of gray here. So for the problem that I was running on 2,400 um, threads, in fact, um, there's, there's a huge amount of idleness. And so from these 2,400 threads, I can say, well, instead of having one master thread and then 50 worker threads in each rank, I can just show you um, the one master thread and a few of the worker threads. And this shows sort of a more detailed view of the application, because it turned out that when I have 2,400 threads, I don't have enough pixels to show everything. And it turns out that many of the master threads don't get shown because there's a 51 chance that they, they, they will appear. OK. So, uh, Anyway, so you can use this to collect, uh, to collect and display data about uh, large-scale executions. One of the other things that we do is we identify where um, waiting is occurring and, and why in your application. So the problem is that if you just measure the application as it, was, as it was running, what you would find is that there are OpenMP threads that are idle and they're waiting for work. And knowing that there are OpenMP threads that are idle doesn't tell you where to fix your program. So what we do is we take the idleness of the worker threads and we attribute it to the work that's happening. And we say that while you were executing this particular piece of code, worker threads were idle. Okay, that tells you where you need to parallelize. So you can see this sort of thing if you're using the trace level view, but you can also see this in the profile view by just looking at where these, where these idleness metrics have gotten attributed. And so what this shows us is the same um, AMG 2006 where it says that 50% of the idleness was in this one particular routine, um, hyper boomer AMG course in Falgut, which was used in the initialization phase. So in fact, that was this, this green phase in here, OK? That 50% of the thread idleness was while this green phase was happening because there was no parallelism there, OK? It was just the master thread working. 
Okay, so uh, the, the support for OpenMP is kind of a moving target. Um, I've been leading the, the design of this, and we have a, a draft that's been approved by the OpenMP ARB. Um, we built a prototype implementation that's, um, one was built by IBM in uh, IBM's lightweight OpenMP runtime, which you don't have available to use on Mira um, because of licensing issues. There's a version in the LLVM runtime, which you can use on Mira with uh, BG Clang. And um, there's also a version that you can use on, on uh, Cooley that's uh, based on the LLVM runtime as well. So we're looking to add this to the um, OpenMP um, standard. And so the, some of the ongoing work are, are to deploy the full OpenMP support for BlueGeneQ. We're working on scaling our I.O. for our tools and also scaling the, the trace viewer. So if we're, you're tracing like enormous things, we want to keep the traces on the system. So there's a way that where you can leave your traces on, say, Cooley, and then run the user interface on your, your uh, laptop and then have the data just sort of thrown at the, the user interface by an MPI program that's running on Cooley. So some other work we have is some work on uh, understanding costs and attributing them to data and uh, analyzing and attributing performance to optimize code, in particular, um, highly inline code. So uh, with that, I think we ought to move on to the next speaker. I'll be happy to answer um, one or two questions now, and uh, I'll be around through midday tomorrow, so I'd be happy to work with you trying to use this tool on your own applications. So any quick questions? Yes? I don't know if you mentioned this already, but can you um, measure the memory traffic with this HPC toolkit? So you can sample using hardware performance counters, and so you can measure the memory traffic through L2, yes. So you can sample on uh, sample using one of the L2 counters, so I could show you how to do that later. Well, because like the <laughs> hardware counters, they count the instructions, not necessarily the number of bytes. Well, okay, so what we're counting is like cache misses. And so the cache miss means that there's data traffic that's happening, okay? Um, we're not actually counting the number of bytes that are moved. You can count loads, um, you can count stores, or you can count cache misses. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yes? The tool installed in other uh HPC support computers besides the Argon ones? Uh, it's installed in supercomputers kind of around the world. Um, it's, so the, the principal users are, are here, and at Livermore, Sandia, and Los Alamos use it as well. And then Australia National University, some of the, some of the Swiss universities, some, some in Britain. Um, but it's principally used on supercomputers. It, it'll also work on, on single node systems as well. You can use it on a workstation just as well.